Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 10. This is our Part 1 of our playoff special. Part 2 will be next week. It's going to be four teams in one episode, Frost Current. We're going to have Schalke. We're going to have Vitality. We're going to have Rogue. We're going to have Splice. Technically not in that order. Technically not in that order. Uh, actually, I guess it won't matter because we do each guest individually and they're like edited in a vacuum. They could make it that order. No. It could be a random order. The order will be Vitality Splice. Followed by... I don't know who's our back half. Yeah, I don't know either. I thought it was like you're coming in with a lot of confidence. I thought like you would just you just whoever shows up whoever next. Whoever shows up next. Yeah. So staggered call times throughout the day. Of course, we're available on Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, and SoundCloud. And ladies and gentlemen, if you missed it, last week we resolved a long-standing debt to G2, specifically Mickey and Yankos. I need we- to make it very clear. So it was the cosplay bet. Yeah. You can go back on the VOD. You can see us wearing the cosplays for G2 versus Excel. <laughs> I could not move. And so when the audience had to, like, cheer for who Uh had the best costume, Uh, of course, it's very easy for Rakan over here to, like, gallant across the stage and, like, wave your arms around. I was wearing, like, these skin-tight faux leather leggings and then, like, bracers on top of it. So when I moved, I had to move like a penguin. Yeah. If I had to, like, pick a spot and just, like, own my space. So just bear with me if you're in podcast land. We'll, we'll elaborate here. We're both wearing shoes where there's, like, claws on the end because they're supposed to look like bird feet, which as a result means you have to, like, pick your legs up and walk kind of like they're clown shoes. The difference for Frostgren, however, is because of her skin-tight leggings, she can't pick up her knees, so she has to waddle her way across the stage. So when it's time comes time to be like, all right, Frostgren, show us what you got. She's like, waddle. <laughs> like, more like a pengu than a, than a Zaya. If anyone's ever seen, like, the the penguin uh, video where they're yeah. in like I don't oh, know God. some cold country and like penguins are trying to like get across <laughs> some the street. Cold country. I think I actually think it's in Russia where you have those three guys in the penguin costumes oh, and one of them go. falls over and they can't get him back up. You could definitely not get up on your own. It was a struggle. Anyway, um, there's pictures on flickercom slash Esports taken by the wonderful Mikhail Conkle as uh, as always. Um, and additionally, there's some footage on broadcast. Maybe we can sneak some footage into this episode as well. It's game four uh, of day two, G2 versus Excel. If you've missed it, hopefully we'll clip out some highlights and put them on our Twitters if you want to see them. Shout out to the cosplayers. Yeah, shout out to the cosplayers who made it for us. Um, you can check out our Instagrams if you want to see their Instagrams because they're tagged there. I do not remember them off the top of my head, sadly. But um, we got a few minutes before our first guest. I want to get initial impressions of what we've seen for playoffs the bracket as it's unfolded, Fnatic 1-2, and obviously our matchup of Schalke versus Vitality, Rogue versus Splice. Does the like tier list of relative strength of these teams accurately reflect where they finished in the regular season? Like, is our is is Splice third best team? Is Fnatic second best team? Is G2 the first best team? And then is Schalke fourth? I think the top three, yes. And mm-hmm. we saw that in Fnatic versus Splice. Um, and I would still bet on Fnatic to win the best of five. In terms of everyone else, though, I think... Um, even though Excel didn't make playoffs, I think Excel is actually like a mid-tier team and sure. it's probably the biggest difference from where they actually finish in the standings to what I think their comparable um, skill ceiling is. And I think it was just a, a time and a synergy issue that they didn't have the time necessary to really make the climb. And if they had gotten Mickey sooner, maybe we'd have an Excel in a playoffs. Um, in terms of everyone else, I was very surprised uh, about Origin. I feel like you hear everything about them behind the scenes in scrims. It sounds like they're doing great. And then they come onto stage and just mental bust. So I think for me, it's Excel and Origin that I really wanted to highlight that I think vastly different results in stage versus I think what their skill shilling really should be. OG was a huge surprise. But the thing, the, the main core that I wanted to have here is that are you willing to have your mind changed? Because we're going to have four teams, four representatives. <laughs> they're going to give us arguments. And inevitably, as they're, they pretty much have to say that they're going to win. Are you ready to be convinced you said top three you feel like is pretty locked, but are you ready for like, if, if like Schalke, if Vitality, if Rogue, if they make some crazy case, you're going to be like, all right, you know what? Rogue is like the dark horse. I'm ready to go. Um, No, but I'll keep an open mind. I think, unfortunately, I kind of come from the, the school of thought where if everyone's good, then no one is. And unfortunately, that makes me also a really critical person where I will use hyperbole and use words like bad when... I mean, there's no... Ah, yes. The hyperbolic word of bad. (laughs) The hyperbolic word of... So hyperbolic. Dumpster fire. No. There you go. I just, there's... Not everyone can be good. Some people, in fact, majority of our teams are mediocre. That's just kind of the nature of it. Um, I think we in Europe have maybe like one and a half really good teams. I'll let everyone else kind of decide what that means in terms of where I, I rank them. And then we have like two decent teams and then everyone else, I'm like, ah, there's a, there's a lot of work to go here. All right. I mean, that's kind of... But that's on the spectrum of, like, the world. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I take it. If it's in terms of the world, 
then I'll take it. I prefer to look more holistically at the LEC, which lets me be a little bit more positive. But if it's holistically in the LEC, I think we have six good teams. Nice. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a more positive note to go on. Uh, and to get things started, let's kick it off with Vitality. Okay. okay so-, so our first guest, none other than the legend, Jack Troll. <laughs> like the things that I want, like I think your most iconic moments... Um, was the Elder Dragon tongue slap steal. Tongue, a lot of Tom Kench themed uh, epic moments. So I, I'll like keep, well, that's the good one. That's the better that's one to highlight. That's the best one. Yeah, I mean, some people think that Tom Kench is my signature peaks because <laughs> of uh, actions like this. But <laughs> I had this champion and I only need to play it when it's actually super OP and uh, my team forces me to. But of course, I prefer other peaks. Yeah, I, uh, that's good to hear because I think that if I would, I would think that there might be something wrong with you if you're like, oh yeah, Tom Kench, this is <laughs> this is the champion. I get no dashes, no agency. You're just gonna follow an eighty carry around. Good. Um, so first off, let's just start easy then. What is your favorite champ? If you could pick to support him to play every game, are you like the Pike Man? Are you the Con uh, player? For sure, hookers. I mean, uh, <laughs> last words. I played a lot of trash. And I had that uh, memor- memorable moment against yeah. uh, RNG. And uh, it's mem- memorable because uh, early went really shit for me. I was miss- missing every hook. I just couldn't hook Uzi or Ming on the laying phase. But then I had uh, really good team fights. And it was actually my first ever MVP that I have ever got in, the, in my career. So uh, I just like it because no matter if I start bad or, or something like this, I can uh, s- stand up mm-hmm. and uh, perform better in the later parts of the game because uh, it just doesn't matter. It doesn't affect me if I play bad early game. Nice. Well, yeah, and like that was, those are, that's obviously a fantastic moment for you and a few highlights. Like, to be fair, you did still make Tom Kench the most, <laughs> one of the most boring supports to watch in the history of League of Legends. Pretty hype when you stole an Elder Dragon, so you could still have those moments sometimes before Yamato <laughs> flames me. Like, do not let him think that he gets to play Thrush every game. Um, on the subject of playoff teams, me and Frost were just talking a little bit before you came on, um, and you were sitting over there. Sorry to break the illusion, folks. Um, so I was curious what, what your thoughts were. Um, from our angle, it's like four through six, a lot of question marks. One through three feels pretty solid. What are, what are your thoughts right now? Uh, so Frost Green said that there is like two or three decent teams. Mm-hmm. So I guess you meant... Uh, like G2 is of, of course on the top, and then there is like Fnatic and Splice, right? And yes, I think uh, Splice is a decent team, but I think they also have a pretty set uh, skill ceiling. For example, if I was playing against them, I would be less worried than if I would play against Origin that they didn't even make it to playoffs. Because when you see Origin, they have really, really good players, and uh, when you play screens against them, you also feel it. It just they didn't, they weren't in the shape uh, in the last weeks of the um, regular split. And I think it's actually the bigger fiasco than whole Misfits year, uh, than Origin not making it to to the playoffs, of course. And um, uh, about the, I think <laughs> Vitality will be a sleeper in the playoffs. I think we will be in uh, good shape in uh, best of fives. Because I look at this in this way, that we always uh, start well and end up poorly. So I think this year will be different. Because we'll be really good in best of fives, <laughs> <laughs> but we are not performing so well in best of ones, you know? So uh, mm-hmm. we're going to surprise a lot of people. There's like two analytical ways to look at vitality. And I really like that you kind of introduced this concept of like the skill ceiling and the fact that you have a team like Origin who theoretically can break through that skill ceiling where it feels like splice to you are really capped by the players. Um, For vitality, you can analytically say like, okay, we know that skill ceiling wise, these guys can pop off because it's virtually the same roster, say for a jungle change that went to Worlds and like made that incredible almost miracle run and did all those crazy things and we've seen like really high highs of vitality and you can look at the other side and be like everything seems to be on fire right now a little bit uh we barely scraped into playoffs no one knows what the consistency is and we don't know which vitality we're going to get are we going to get the vitality where like you guys just combust and everyone looks like they're running around with uh heads chopped off are we going to get the vitality where we go to worlds we take down rng we're possibly even make it out of you know like a really stacked group, like which one is actually showing up to playoffs? 
Uh, I think if it's going to start a team, we had many issues throughout the year. But I think our issues right now are good issues. I think um, sometimes it doesn't look like we are playing as a team because we have so many ideas. Uh, we're winning here and there, and we're just giving more, more info. And he has to decide on which lane he has to play for. But sometimes we, we just give him some, some ideas that he gets lost in uh, this whole concept. So we started to do something like uh, giving him more specific info and also direct him. Uh, when we had um, the game against SK in tiebreaker, uh, it was no longer like uh, we're freezing the wave, uh, you can come or you can do whatever. Uh, I'm just telling directly Mowgli that uh, please keep, keep blue and come, it's going to be a good uh, moment to gank them. And of course it resulted in a kill. So we are trying this kind of approach, even though it's um, not so long before playoffs, I think we can adapt uh, fast enough to implement it in uh, our best of five against Schalke. Where does that um, that kind of like confidence and faith uh, like come from? Like, is this just in your experience? You've been in the past a team that's like struggled and been able to adapt. Like, because I think on paper, as Frost was mentioning, that there's a ton of ups and downs. And when you came in here, right? Like, I I know that tiebreaker day was incredibly stressful, but already you're like super composed. You're like, we've got this. There's no problem. And that's such a change from when we saw you guys on Saturday, where it's like, holy <laughs> crap! Like, we, thank God we made playoffs. Everything is okay. Um. Is there just a lot of confidence in your teammates? I mean, I just don't allow us not to go worlds. Uh, it's going to be so hard for me to accept it. So it's just better to win uh, the, uh, the gauntlet and, uh, of course, um, get to there. Uh, but uh, jokes aside, uh, I think um, I believe in my teammates, of course. Uh, I know them for the two years already. And I know that when it matters the most, we can show up big time. And uh, I think uh, if it comes to the our matchup in Schalke, if we get a good draft, we, we we can win for sure the best of five. Also, we're the team that sometimes goes vabank va um, when we just leave you you open and it's SK in the most important game of the season. So yeah, we we have shown some. Uh, boss of steel in that moment. <laughs> I think it's, it's uh, I think it's fair to say that Vitality are not a consistent team, but they are a very clutch team, mm -hmm. um, and that you guys can find that six gear. Why do you leave Yumi open? Because you guys leave Yumi open more than any other team. You also play, you play Yumi a lot more than any other team, but you guys uh, seem like you're very willing. Like, is that you and Attila saying you guys are fine with this matchup? Is this the team as a whole being like, we don't actually think Yumi's that strong. We've got counters prepared. So when it comes to the Yumi, <laughs> I think also I wanted to say a big problem of us uh, in the split was that we were really late in the meta. Uh, we, we've been, we have been a slow reader of a, of a meta. So we started to play Yumi at the beginning of the split but we didn't have much success with it, so we just dropped it. Then people started to play it really well, so we picked it, pick it up again. Then Zaya Rakan came in, and we were not really prepared to play it. Then we started to play it. Then people started to play counters to it, you know? So we have always been really late in the meta, so that's why our drafts also didn't look so good uh, throughout the summer split. But I think it comes mostly on the uh, on the players because they talk about the matchups mm -hmm. and they tell coach what they want to play or what is or what they think about the specific champions. And why did we leave Yumi open? Um, I don't really want to share our thought process, but uh, we just we knew that we're gonna handle it well because we also will end up in the decent uh, bot lane matchup. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I think we work much better as a team if I'm on engager rather than on a champ like Yumi. Even though Yumi can be a great uh, engager, I think we just work much better if uh, I'm on Alisa, Rakan, or whatever. And to be fair, I, we've seen the Yumi pick punished by you. Uh, now, admittedly, the Fnatic game did not go... <laughs> Super fantastic in the mid to late game, but in the early game, we did see the raw power of Volibear, and uh, 
why you should absolutely never pick Yumi into that champion because she can just never go back to an ally once she leaves. So I just think it's really interesting. Uh, Vitality, I study a lot of drafts and teams, and you guys in particular um, don't seem to be as afraid of quirky matchups than other teams. You don't seem to be as afraid of Aatrox matchups as other teams, and you definitely are not afraid of Yumi as other teams. And these are like the three big picks that really revolve or really have like an impact in the meta. Is this coming from the players? Is this like Juzuke saying, I can play either side of the quirky matchup and anything, so we don't need to leverage bands at it? Is this coming from Cabochard? Is this coming from you? Or is this like, again, a systematic vitality coach thing? You don't have to give me your specific, like in-depth uh, hints about why. Yeah, no problem. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's not a big secret. It mostly comes from the players and their view on the situation and also their confidence because uh, you also need to look on the player matchup, not only on the champions uh, matchup, you know. Uh, for example, against G2, we know they have many counters, so we adapt to this uh, in the specific way as well. And about the Yumi, you know, uh, I was the first one to pull out the Fiddlesticks in Europe. Um, I think only in, in the world as well, I've only JD Gaming support played Fiddlesticks. And, um, you know, I, I would describe my Fiddlesticks equivalent to Bipos Aatrox. If it's open, I'll, I'll just take it, you know. Uh, <laughs> I think this champion is just um, high quality and it could be played in uh, any matchup if it's correctly. If it's played correctly, of course. And about the Yumi, um, about the <laughs> Fanatic game, we just didn't expect at all Garen. <laughs> Garen Yumi is what makes Yumi OP because um, as long as she stays alive and she can just poke, it's really obnoxious to deal with. And uh, from all of the teams, Fanatic beat Garen. It's, it's absolutely nuts. I didn't nuts. expect it either. Yeah, to be nuts. fair, that's a pretty big curveball. Yeah. Reckless on Karma slash Janna was enough of a curveball, but like, <laughs> holy crap, just like, how simple can we go? It's going to be Darius next game, just like, Oh, I was caught off guard. Um, talking a little bit specifically about your matchup versus Schalke, is there anything that you're looking at when it comes to approaching this team? Anything you're focusing on? Um, like when we talk about a lot about this team, we talk a lot about like Trick and the impact he has. And of course, upset versus Attila. <laughs> and Attila talked about this. It's not really like as much of a thing anymore. Obviously, they both still want to win, but they're both. it's not like they're both young guns anymore. They've been here for a little while. So what, what are you looking at when it comes to that matchup? So I think Schalke... Improved in summer split playing around the mid lane, especially 2v2, Trick and Abadaga. And as long as we're gonna control this 2v2, uh, I think we're just gonna take it home. It's not, no longer Schalke that, I mean, of course they want to get upset ahead, but they mostly do it through mid lane rather than the bot lane, because just better, uh, safer, and more reliant. Uh, so as long as we get good draft in 2v2 of mid lane, I think we will have upper hand. Mm. Um, I expect so much of some bot lane be, to be explosive, so much of to be just, uh, um, how do I say it? Uh, scaling. Oh, scaling. scaling. I was looking for the word, just <laughs> scaling. But it's best of five, so of course I expect to not have only like brown time catch matchup on the bot lane. <laughs> I expect Ignar to have some uh, spicy hookers coming to into our series. And I'm looking forward to this uh, game because it's all or nothing. If we lose, Summer Split will be over for us because we cannot make it to Gauntlet. And if we win, uh, our journey will continue. And when we started 0-4 in the split and then we made comeback and then we also finished 0-4 uh, in the last two weeks, it just... Uh, came across in the mind that uh, we are capable of d doing many things, but we are capable of doing many int moments. Mm. So uh, I think we either gonna show up big time in playoffs or just fall, fall off completely. So is but I truly believe in the first option. All right, so is this like a 3-0 or, are you, or is this still gonna be like a little bit of a wacky, zany 3-1, 3-2? Give, give me the prediction <laughs> for your team. Are you 3-0 are you, are you confident? Is it like 3-0 or 0-3? Is that what we're looking at here for Vitality? I think 3-0 unless Ignar pops off on uh, Blitzcrank. Oh God, <laughs> there it is, the bait. Will, will he actually pick it? 
Um, we still got about five minutes left with you, Jay Actual. So I, I want to talk a little bit about you specifically as a player. Um, and, and Frost, you kind of brought this up earlier, so I think I'll let you take this one. Um, so following Jack Troll's uh, qualification into playoffs, you guys beat SK. And I went on Reddit and social media. I don't know why. And I just saw like all of these negative comments specifically directed at you. Um, and I just remember thinking to myself, like, A, casters deal with the, that shit all the time, as do players. And it, it just fiddlestick sucks like it's just it hurts um and i was like this is so crazy because um what i know about your story i think that you're one of like the hungriest players in our league but then i just kind of thought about it and i was like maybe people don't really know jack troll's background or like his story or how important it is for you to have this drive and to be a professional player i think we got to see a little bit of that when you had um like your emotional display on stage um but I, I wanted to give like an opportunity to figure out who Jack Troll is and to hopefully have fans like better connect to you as a player. Because I think your story is uh, really cool. Uh, sure. Um, I, I would just uh, say a bit about, about the comments. I think it's really addictive to read them. So I just don't look at them anymore. I used to because it's just cool to read something good. But also clicks something in your mind if people say bad things about you and it's really addictive so I just stopped doing that uh, about the, my story is that um, when I was in my final year of the school I had an opportunity to uh, either try to all in on my pro career or to continue education and I was wondering because uh, I had an offer from the Polish team that was not even the top one or top, top two but they had on gaming house and I would finally have opportunity to have good, decent conditions to play the game. And then my dad told me that when I was uh, wondering if I should go school or pro, uh, son, you cannot be great in two directions. Uh, you can be average at best if you want to do this and this, but you can be absolutely the best if you just choose the one thing. And as we know today, I just uh, have chosen uh, pro gaming. And back then, uh, when I was in Ago Gaming, it's called uh, the team was called like that. Uh, I had to travel over 600 kilometers to the big city of Warsaw, and uh, basically I left all my friends behind. Uh, I didn't even come for Christmas to my home because I would give up a couple of days of solo queue and improving myself. And during that period of eight months, I told myself that I'm gonna get a good offer afterwards. Because I didn't choose this team for the success on Polish scene. I know we'll not win any tournament because just the players were much worse than the top team uh, back then in the Poland. So I just... And uh, back in my hometown, I was playing on the laptop on 30 FPS, but I was still constantly getting to Challenger. Even when I had like 80 ping, 30 FPS, I still was getting to Challenger. So I thought, okay, uh, I think... I have potential, but I need to have good conditions. That's why I have chosen this uh, offer. And um, as I said, during this eight months in uh, Gaming House, I never visited my hometown again. I never visited any friends. I was just so focused on playing League of Legends and to improve myself, because if it didn't work out, I would probably end up in some uh, fast food server, you know, service. Yeah. Good luck uh, in the sports moment. Yep. Um, so I was playing like 16 to 18 hours a day uh, in solo queue. I was really high in like, like top five. And then uh, when my contract finished, uh, I was still not paid for five months of salary. I was really depressed. It was also in the time I have gained 20 or 30 kilograms of weight because I was so depressed because my organization was so shit. Didn't pay our money, didn't provide food. So I was just eating McDonald's kebab every day things that were inexpensive yeah exactly <laughs> um and then i had only one offer after my contract finished i had uh, an offer from giants to attend the tryouts so i was so super hyped about them i think i played two or three games with them and they accepted me already so this is how my pro career began was there moments kind of like in in the the back end where you're not getting paid, where you're still living in the gaming house, where you're like, I'm, it's over. Like, did you was it? Did you ever lose faith, or no, are you the kind of guy that no, just like never, kept holding out? Never, never. I just kept, kept going. I uh, 
I'm pretty decent friends with your coach, Yamato. And so I knew of your story because I was talking to him at Worlds. And he always speaks very highly of you. And there's different players that you see all over the league because everyone comes from different backgrounds and different struggles. Um, but I was really stricken with your story in particular because uh, coming from like that much of like nothing and giving everything to try to make the drive for it. So um, nothing but respect. Also, I, I was never considered as a good player in Polish scene even because uh, there have also been tryouts to the best Polish team, mm -hmm. but I didn't even make it as a third uh, support, even though I think uh, I had the best performance in the trials back then, but uh, I was considered toxic in the team environment, which I think was bullshit. But I, well, I didn't choose me as a support by that back then, because he was the main um, character to choose his support mm -hmm. to play, and he didn't choose me. Um, so I hope we meet in semifinals of playoffs, and I'm going to beat his ass off. <laughs> 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 for that, for that, um, for that time, and yeah, I mean, uh, I think just because I came such, I wouldn't say such a long journey because it was relatively short, but such a tough and hard uh, with so many obstacles. Yeah, yeah, it uh, made me as a person that I'm right now. That. Uh, doesn't matter what's happening. I just, I'm just gonna work hard, and I know it's gonna pay off one day. Damn, that's inspirational, and that's also all the time we have, Jack. Well, thank you so much thank for you. talking to us, dude. Super good luck to you. I, the stars might have to align um, for you to get your your Woolite vengeance, but I will also tell you that we will murder that narrative to death on broadcast next year <laughs> if we don't get a chance to do it this year because sure. it's. Super funny. Thank you for talking a bit of Thank snack. You very much. Thank My you pleasure. for sharing your story. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. Um, obviously, Vitality versus Schalke. I don't know if it's Friday or Saturday, but it's happening. Tune in for that. And thank you again, Jack Troll, for being here. It's awesome. Thank you. Jack Thank you. All right, we're back. Uh, our next guest is, of course, none other than Duke. Um, head coach, I think, is your title, head coach? Uh, inside the team, I'm strategic coach. Strategy coach. We have academy team and the main team. Yeah, they want you closer yep. to the mic oh, yeah. so we can Sorry. get that, you gotta get, like, that right good strategy. Here. This is a tutorial for anyone watching as you rotate around um, the mic. So, All right, fun strategy fact. coach. You're the guy on stage, and that's what matters to the viewers. I gave you vote for coach of the split, <gasps> so... Oof. I hope I'm not alone. Did you also vote for Duke? I haven't voted yet. I told you earlier today. I haven't done my ballot. Oh, surprise. Well, I'm an American. You. I don't participate in the election <laughs> process. Clearly, you can see what happens. You have to have German citizenship, I guess, to, to, to <laughs> vote here. Avoiding it all. I'm a bad, bad citizen. Um, all right. So, Frosteren, if, if you're just going to start that way, give us give us the the speech what's your what's your vote for duke like? i think it's always really difficult to figure out what coaches actually do and the role isn't um standardized across multiple teams so a coach in one team versus a coach in another team could have completely different jobs be doing the jobs really well but then it's really hard to compare them so i always think that voting for coach of the split kind of bullshit yeah i'm gonna be great it's a <laughs> bullshit award but coaches do deserve recognition yes. coaches deserve way more recognition and respect than they get but i also have no idea what you do in scrims you could literally rock up every day and be like what am i doing Peter done here's my draft i'm gonna go on stage and look pretty like i have no idea right like that's the that's the downside and so the reason why it felt really safe to go with splice um is because it feels like no matter what musical chair of roster that you guys are running with um you somehow are able to print out kind of like very similar teams or at least very similar expectations and the fact that the management system seems to be like the most consistent part of splice over its many iterations and for splice to make such a strong uh surge this split i was like it is time. It is time for the splice management and the coaches to get the recognition. This is our only actionable bullshit award, but I hope you get it. <laughs> and um, I, I agree that it's kind of bullshit because it's pretty hard to know exactly what other coach is doing. I, like, I have no idea what the other coaches are doing. In, I mean, you have the rumors, obviously, but yeah. they are super biased because of if the players liked them or didn't like yeah, them. Yeah, like like the, 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 the coach is either like, wow, really insane coach, or like, wow, this guy does nothing. Yeah, so um, it's... It, it's pretty hard to know, so I think you ha just have to look at... I think it's just the difference between expectation and results that, or rumors that you hear um, behind the scenes. Um, I mean, we had already the, the... Peter had the coach of the split award, I think, spring split last year. Um, but I think, uh, like, if it... Like, when it comes to our coaching staff, I think it's 
it's more that we have now a really robust co coaching staff with multiple multiple people working in it, uh, and we kind of build this synergy, especially I would say me with Mac, um, who is um, so head of player development, so kind of assistant coach, um, and we have a really strong um, synergy together where he's kind of the, the good cop of the team, I'm the bad cop, and we uh, go back and forth and exchange a lot of ideas, um, and. Since we have been having this staff for two years and we kind of refine what's best for us, so we changed. I, I went on stage this year. Uh, Peter was more between the academy and the main team. Um, so I'm handling the screams with Mac, and we have now an, an analyst. We have the new, I don't know if you saw the Viking that came in, uh, in our, that is on stage, not on stage, but behind the scenes with us. It is more halfway between a trainer, a sport trainer, and a sports psychologist. Um, so we have a lot of things that we add. Um, split after split and I think now we kind of have this a good recipe for us to to be working well together. So what was the breakthrough this year? Because I feel like I, it's easy for me to say or maybe there wasn't one right but from our perspective at least from a broadcast perspective Splice have been on a pretty solid rise mm -hmm. and it always felt like you were on the outside looking in on the top three and now it feels like you're securely there and I don't think there's anyone that's close. I like People might argue first the four through six teams but right now it feels like Splice is chasing Fnatic and G2 and everyone else is kind of chasing Splice. Is this a matter of your team? Like, Do you feel like jumping up significantly was there a big catalyst or is it maybe something like OG have just fallen off the face of the planet and so you're just kind of the next in line? I think it's a bit of everything and the thing is we can be chasing the top three and, and like fighting against Fnatic for example the game that we had on Friday was extremely close um, but at the same way like it, it's all about highs and lows in uh, with, the, with, the, with the team and we, we can be that team but we can also sometimes show not the best performance and at the moment I think all the teams in playoffs are actually pretty strong. Um, so it all depends on which version of us show up. And I think the biggest work we have been doing in the past eight months, and that's the reason I think we have been uh, consistent at least, is about our mindset. Um, it's a lot about mindset and how we approach trainings, how we approach games. And if we are able to have, uh, to be the perfect version of ourselves for playoff, which I hope we will, that's what we are working actively on this week, uh, we can definitely even, like I think, beat Fnatic. The question is, if, can we reach this this status, this status of performance? If not, we might even lose to to anyone. So that's also the reason reason I think we have been good is that we never felt like we didn't, never had this cockiness of thinking that uh, we were the best and we treat every opponent kind of the same. And we know that basically, uh, if we are in our best state, we can bet we can beat anyone, and that's all we focus on anyway. And at the moment, we are basically at the same mental state that we were at the beginning of, of Summer Split. It's just another opponent for us, and yeah, let's be the best version of ourselves. So, then my follow-up question is, the Fnatic game, obviously the most recent indicator of how you guys will stack up against, mm -hmm. um, you know, the kind of the perceived top two. Uh, was that a good game from Splice? Was that like a good game going neck and neck? Did you, was there like... Do you look at that game and go like, this is where we're at now. I feel okay about this. We need to ramp up for playoffs. Or do you look at that and go, a lot of our weaknesses were showing there. And like, this is like more of like a recipe for what we need to improve on than like a showing of our best strength. I would just say that I would say that we can do better than this, but it was a pretty good game, pretty solid game overall. I think uh, it's funny because I was listening, I think it was to Young Buck and Grabs talking about, about us like last week and uh, and talking about our lack of uh, mid-game fundamentals, which which was true uh, for for some part of the split, like mid-game, um, uh, I would say efficiency, um, which kind of tends basically that is the that's how we use the word macro in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, against Fnatic, it was like we matched them totally on that aspect, and uh, I think they had a pretty solid early game, and. The game just came down to a few mechanical mistakes in team fights in the end, and also misunderstanding of how we should play team fights against a champion that we were not used anymore to play against. Uh, that doesn't really show in the current meta, and that, that was also pretty fed at the point. So it was really hard to navigate around him in team fights. But um, yeah, I, th I think the game against Fanti was pretty good. We can do better. We can do better for sure. I think our game against Origin uh, last week was re really good too. Um, and I think in the past two weeks, I, I, we, we worked a lot on our mid game and in the past two weeks we improved a lot and I think on, on stage it showed to some extent. Um, and now we kind of have to 
fix a bit like go back to fix our early game that has been lacking while it was it used to be our strength for the rest of the summer split but if we're able to make everything come together i think we can be better than what we have been against Fnatic on friday how close um do you think you're right now to Fnatic? do you think it's like neck and neck or is it that splice must be in perfect form to actually take down Fnatic? the thing is i think if Fnat- splice must be in perfect form but to beat perfect from Fnatic, I would say. But the thing is, which kind of Fnatic are you facing? So I think, yeah, I, th- I think we can beat them for sure. Um, we need to be, but that's the thing. We always need to be on perfect form. That, like, the, the thing is, we have a system that only works if uh, everyone is giving their best at any point, whether it's in shot calling, uh, communication structure, thinking process about the game. Everyone is involved. Everyone has his responsibility. So if we are not able to um, to bring our best, Basically, our, our, how we function as a team doesn't work. So, even not only Fnatic, but pretty much everyone. That's why we only focus on always being at our best form. Else, no matter the opponent, we can win or lose. I'm really glad that you kind of brought up all of these different pieces. Because when I watch Splice and talk to the players and kind of look back at your guys' organization, it feels like it is quite structured into crafting this perfect form. In China, they call uh, G2 like the artists um, because there seems to be this creativity or like imagination and artistry that goes to their their playing. And to me, it feels like that's kind of the secret ingredient that Splice is missing, where they're like a very well-structured, very well-oiled machine. They don't have that same whatever it is, that, that artistry magic. Do you feel that or do you think that the splice members just haven't shown it yet i think they can just show it in a different way i think we just have to like once we are able to stabilize um a game that is based on our view of the game that is more towards fundamentals and maybe playing a bit less crazy for sure I think then the individual can show up and f- for sure those players have a lot to show you so humanoid you so Zuxe, but any one of them like chachi i can like is, I think he's the top in having the most solo kill in the, in the history of LEC or something like this. Uh, Corbin to have been doing pretty well in lane uh, in 2v2 since the beginning of the season. Um, I, we can show up at any different way. That's always what I tell to my players. Like We are not going to be the best version of ourselves if we try to imitate G2. We can try to take the best from them. Uh, I mean, take, no, not take the best because we can't always take the best from G2, but try to analyze what what are they doing good and sometimes replicate it to some extent. But I think that's basically what defines Splice is that it's not like we have a specific style aside from the late game meme, but it's more because we had a poor mid game than just it. We were not trying to reach late game. I think we had a poor mid game and sometimes a bit of a mid late game oriented champion pool. But uh, overall, uh, we try to take ideas from everywhere and see what works for us and kind of try to be able to master all the styles so also that we can kind of diffuse all the time in the same same way because we understand them. And that's what I tell to my players. So we, we shouldn't train and, and, and be like G2, but just try to analyze what they are doing with our own approach. I like the value, the value that you have on the system and structure, but um, when you describe it as like, all of these pieces kind of needing to come together and everyone needing to play on form, it makes it sound very fragile to me. Do you do you feel like uh, on any given day, like if a, any player is in like a bad mood when you're about to go on stage, you're like, oh God, like it's all going to fall apart or if your prep isn't 100% up to snuff, does it, does it feel fragile to you? Or is it like, is it a bit more okay if one person has a bad day the rest of the team can carry does that structure also provide safety or is it like very limiting too I mean, it, it provides safety for sure too because i mean else we wouldn't have this position in the standings um it provides safety in the sense that i think we can reach our best form that is necessary to be- beat uh, a team like fnatic so it's you can think it's fragile if you want to beat a team like fnatic right but um also it also means that we are kind of dividing the responsibility. So if like a, a piece of the engine doesn't work, mm-hmm. well, we are still working to some extent at 80% or something like this. Um, but, um, and even if we need every, like everyone has, has a role, but at least it's not like we are super relying on one player. And if he has a bad game, we are totally, uh, we are we are out of the game no matter what. Um, but yeah, to be, to be the best version of ourselves, we are reliant on this, but... Also, that's our approach as a coaching staff is that we put a lot, a lot of emphasis on on this more than the, I mean, the gameplay in a sense for me is the, 
the people talk about the coaches, about the game knowledge, etc. But I think the more I coach, the more I realize that it's kind of secondary. Uh, it's more that game knowledge is what anyone has to 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 have to enter the business to to be respected by the players, to know what he's talking about. But at some point, it's kind of the easy part of the job. And the like the actual part of the job is to be able to, to put your players in the right condition, the mental condition. And when you see a team like Vitality, like last year, not, not this year because they improved a lot, but last year, I never respected Vitality as a team uh, for their approach of the game. I think they, have, they were always playing super uh, out, of, out of the box in a sense, but not in a good way. But it was so decisive, and, so, and when you hear when a player like Jack Troll, who is so um, motivated and determined uh, to, to reach success, uh, that's what built this Vitality squad, in a sense. And it's more what was outside of the game than what they were actually doing in the game, where it was working because they were all on board with it. And um, I mean, that's, for example, something that I learned a bit from watching Vitality last year, because I was wondering how can a team like this succeed? Um, but yeah. It's all about all about the mindset and the and make sure that the players are going in the right direction. And so, as a staff, that's our main focus in general. And maybe, like maybe we we are reliant on the big match to be on our perfect form. But we also know that that's how we are. That's we are working every second towards too. I mean, good to know what the finish line looks like. Right? Good to look at and understand what the best version of your team is. Um, Frost, if you want to hit anything else up here the next time, or we can talk a little bit about the first match upcoming. <laughs> uh, I guess I was just really curious. You guys picked Rogue, yeah? Mm -hmm. So is can I ask why you chose to dodge Vitality? Or did, was it not even anything about Vitality? Because you just spoke pretty highly of them, and it was simply about getting the, the better matchup for you guys into Rogue. I mean, I think Rogue are a better team than Vitality team. But um, I think stylistically, uh, Vitality are not a great match for us um, because of the chaos that um, goes into the, that, that lies into the game. And also, like they are, I think in best of five, they might be more dangerous with more experience, more ability to uh, go for decisive plays uh, that are unexpected, Baron Colt, etc. And we still have some respect for this Vitality squad. Um, Rogue is the opposite. I think they are a better team at the moment, but also they have some rookies. Um, they might they might hesitate in those moments, and stylistically in terms of how they play the game. But I can't really go into it. Uh, we thought that Rogue might be an easy, um, it, like, m might be easier to approach as a team. But doesn't that mean that as like you guys fall past Rogue? Because it sounds like you want to stay away from teams that have like a lot of improv or improvisation that might mess up your guys' system or how controlled Splice like to be. Mm. So would that mean that Rogue and Shalka are kind of like the go-tos, the, the teams that you guys want to go through? And once you run into things like Vitality, to a lesser extent, Fnatic, and then G2, that stylistically it gets a lot scarier for Splice? Maybe, but it's more than... The thing is, we we were talking to the players and we thought like we were not at our best last week for sure. I think we had a really rough week of practice and we knew that we were not at our best last weekend um, and the question is can we go back to our best form for next week and if we do we should beat any any of those teams no matter what so it's not a question about like we were not that it, again it's all about ourselves so if we are at our best form we should destroy them and the thing is um, vitality it's just that there is a random factor in Vitality. There is a random factor that if, like, we, we don't really want to deal with those random uh, backdoors or whatever, how, how they usually win games that, sh that shouldn't be won, the same way that they lose games that shouldn't be lost. Like, when they lost against us, it was, it was a tragedy for them. Uh, they should never, we should never win that game. But um, in best of five, they have sh I mean, they, they might, like, s since we assume that we should never lose to them, uh, we don't want to have a random factor that goes into the equation where they can just go do some random things or pick some, like, cheeses. Uh, we, we still also have the scars of last year. We got cheese basically in every best of five, best of one against them. Um, so, yeah, let's give, let's put aside, I think Schalke will deal with them. And, uh, and let's put aside this random factor. Yeah, and I mean, looking at your regular season matches versus Rogue, uh, both were quite dominant. One was, of course, the iconic Xerxes Gragas performance where he had like 20 stacks on Magi's. So that was like 
pretty heroic performance from him. And the other game uh, where Humanoid and Kabe were obviously, uh, were on the Ezreal and the Azir respectively and were um, honestly just outperforming their counterparts on the opposite side. So like I can, I can see why um, both in terms of stylistic and just in terms of history, you'd prefer to play a team like Rogue. Is this the kind of matchup, I know you said you focus and you respect each opponent equally, but do you feel like this is a matchup where Splice can come in confidently into playoffs and say like, this should be a 3-0 for us? Because I mean, it is at the end of the day, it is like third place team versus, mm -hmm. I, I guess they finished fifth technically, um, but I would still would have looked at them as, as kind of like fifth slash sixth coming into playoffs. I think 3-0 is a... I mean, we can 3-0 again. I mean, it, it's hard for me to say because I know what we can do, that, but I know that we need to kind of get back a bit to our best shape before the end of the week. Mm. Um, if we're in our best shape, I think it should be a 3-0. But, uh, but the question is, can we can we reach that, that stage? Um, I think, again, like, we respect every opponent, but that's... But we don't fear any any of them. Uh, so we when we face when we face them, I think we will be really confident for sure. And the players are really confident. Uh, and yeah, I think I, I wouldn't say three zero. It's it's really hard to to give a prediction like this. But three zero or three one, I would say. All right, Frost. Closing statements. Final thoughts. One more question. I don't know. I I always really enjoy listening to you speak, Duke. I think the more time that I spend in the LEC, the easier it is to see like how different each of the teams are in terms of how they view the game and almost like the texture of the team. And Splice to me are always very interesting. I know you hate like those. It's like texture? Like what? I don't know how to explain. It's like you look at a team like Vitality and it's like that explosive hunger, drive, chaotic nature. You look at a team like G2, it's that artistry, that um, creativity, creativity, friend, bunch of friends playing the game. But very loud. And then it's yeah. Splice. It's like hyper controlled, very systematic, um, hyper professional almost it feels and it's just I don't know it creates a I'm a very visual person it creates like a very interesting collage in my head where I'm like ah oh, there's a lot of teams like no one is the same so sorry that's where my mind went I was just like zoning out during that conversation I was like he's a really interesting guy but he's also super controlled as a coach of, like what you want to hide versus what you'll promote and what you're saying which is interesting do you want to do you want to flame anyone you're very like just any any let's get a closing, yeah, state, flame closing statement from Duke because Frostgarden went on a texture rant how do you you can tell me how you feel about your texture uh, any, I, I'm not too sure what my what our texture means but, but <laughs> I, I agree I agree that that, that we are we, okay the soul of the I know, team I that's it, what I'm talking yeah, about I'm just giving you shit I'm sorry <laughs> Um, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Duke. I mean, I, th I think yes, we have this professional and structured approach, but I think more and more. And the thing is, we always had this ambition to to be one of the top teams, right? And when you arrive in this, se this season, you see top teams like G2, Origin, Fnatic, that are three teams that have a lot of veterans. That uh, I think, like almost, there, there are championship winners in all of those teams. Um, they have like really experienced short callers uh, that kind of know the game already, basically. And we, 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 I mean, I don't go into a season thinking that I'm not going to be able to play uh, with the, the big teams in, in the league. And so we arrived and we knew that we were lacking a lot of this experience, of this knowledge that we had to build from the beginning. And having kind of a lenient approach and more uh, fun approach wouldn't work because we had way too much to, to work on. And so, yes, we started with, we have a really structured approach, really professional approach, but the more and more we grow and the more and more we stabilize and we kind of, um, how to say, um, I don't have the, the word in English, but we are able to reach, to, to come close to their level and to their knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, the more the players are able to express themselves and to also, they, they feel more at ease, I would say, at expressing whether they skill, but also uh, their personality. I think a player like Zerk, say, for example, drew a, a lot. If you compare him to who he was last year uh, when he arrived at Splice, I think he grew a lot as a player, but also as a, I would say, not say as a boy, but as a man maybe now. Yeah, yeah, and uh, sure. I mean, that's what I told, that's the first, first thing I told my players is that the main goal for, for me is not, I mean, the first thing they have to, to be, to be the players I want them to be is basically to grow as man uh, and don't be boys anymore because that's the main problem I have in esports is that the, the the players tend to be boys uh, in general a lot and uh, and the thing is you need them to, if you need them to be competitors if you need them to be athletes or wh wh whatever you want to call them they need to be able to take responsibility of what they are doing they be, they be able they need to be able to to work um, 
with um, feel, feel something that pro players rarely feel, which is the actual effort. And effort is not something that you learn uh, before becoming a pro player because of, um, uh, because of what's the usual path of becoming a pro player. And so all of those things that are not easy to learn, that's something that they have to learn. And I think it can be learned only the hard way. And once they are able to reach that state, then they can be the best version of, of themselves and then go further and maybe express not only their um, their own their own way to express their skill or their talent, but also their personality. Awesome. Yeah, just like fantastic closing words. Thank you, Duke, for coming on. Of course, you can watch Rogue vs. Spice this Friday, I believe. Um, I'm excited to see what you guys can do in playoffs, man. And uh, yeah, thank you for the the insight there from, from children to adults, from boys to men. Super cool. That was like the ultimate motivational speech. Yeah. Cool. AKA, grow up, kids in solo queue. <laughs> All right, our, our third guest of the day, none other than Dylan Falco. I, head coach, is that your title? Yeah. Head coach of Shalco No Feeder. Um, first off, welcome, Dylan. We had upset on to talk last week, but I think it's good to hear from you guys again, especially coming into playoffs. Um, first off, how do you feel kind of like about Shalco's form right now? It feels like you guys have had some really, really sick, really dominant games, and you guys have had, had, had some struggle games. Are you feeling confident heading into playoffs? Uh, I, I think just from having an inside perspective on how our team's playing, um, and our last week, I think, was a 2-0. Um, we feel really very, very confident, I think. Um, we think that like, we finished top four, which I think is good for us, but we want more. And we're all just trying really hard and trying to take a spot in Worlds, basically. I mean, it's exciting because when yeah. Upset came on last week, uh, you know, we know a lot about his kind of personal ambition. And it, for him, it's all about being the best. And part of that is, is showing your best on a world stage. And for, for players like, like Trick uh, and, and Ignar kind of returning to that stage as well. Um, even Odo, God, you actually have a very, outside of Abadag, you have a very veteran roster. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's very easy for me to forgive, uh, uh, forget that. Um, before we talk about your matchup versus Vitality specifically, I'm curious, um, we just had Duke on to talk a little bit about structure. Can you share a bit of insight into how Schalke works as a team? Um, for reference, you've got like G2, which is obviously very crazy, very player driven. Yeah. You've got, and Schalke is very much, or uh, rather Spice is very much like... Talking about the texture of the teams? The texture is the word that Frostgren used earlier, which I won't, it doesn't make any sense. The kind of the culture of the team. The, the soul of the team. Soul, sure. I, culture, I think, is a fine word here. Uh, and, you know, Spice is very much like minimize variables very 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 structured like where, where do you see Schalke in that is it is it somewhere on the spectrum in between those two things is it completely different uh, talk to me about it so I think from like a practice perspective and from a preparation perspective I would I would say that like texture I guess our team would be <laughs> Stop, we're, please we're very texture, please. we're very like try hard um, basically like we try to be very prepared for every day of practice uh, we make sure everything is structured as far as what we're practicing why we're practicing it um, I think our approach and vision on how the game should be played is very set and has been set almost this entire year um, it kind of comes from what I think I learned last year a lot of it of how I feel the game should be played and then a lot of it also of how Trick feels it should be uh, with him coming in summer split. Um, as far as play style and what we allow and what we want to do when we're actually like playing the game on stage, I also want us to be very free as far as like being able to outplay the opponent. Like I, I wouldn't want to be a team that plays something like Splice because I feel like sometimes the way they approach mid game, for example, kind of limits themselves. And although I want our a preparation to be structured. I want our play in the game to be very free and open to being creative and making the best play in the moment. When I watch uh, Shalka, I'm glad that you used the word the best play in the moment. Yeah. They do feel like a bit of a reactionary team and that you guys have your plans, like where your composition should spike, what you're looking for, where you want to move it around. But when it comes to like those split second decisions of like the Rift Herald or the Dragon, I think that Shalka are a very good team fighting team. And I'm curious if that goes along with being quite reactionary and then how you trained to be good at team fighting or is this just we have upset he's one of the best team fighting ADCs in the world so naturally we're just good at it um I, I don't think it really has to do with having upset on our team I think it's two things one um I think good fighting champions in general are really strong um the game I think should be kind of bloody especially on major objectives and I think two trick is very very good macro wise at setting up objectives and he knows when to play for dragon when to play for herald um and how to do this which is why I think so many of our like wins have been around good dragon fights or good herald setups or good swaps for second turret, for example. Um, and because we do this a lot and it's kind of like bread and butter of our play style, uh, a few of our losses have been kind of lost at these moments as well. 
So do you think like what is the biggest defining moment in those in those uh, is those losses? Is it a little bit of that freedom, like players just forgetting that like they need to give a bit more respect in the situation than they normally would have? Not respecting enemy champions? Is it like skipping steps and setup, getting ahead of themselves? What happens when these when these fights go wrong, or is it just mis-execution in a fight? Um, sometimes it's just mis-execution. Uh, I, I would say. Also, often in our losses, I think one or two of them in the last half of the split, I think we're kind of draft related. Like we're in a position where we probably can't really win the fight because they had better champions or because they are ahead early game, for example. I know there's one game we played against Spice where there was just, they're kind of fed out of control and then we still go to Herald and fight and die. Can we talk shop? Do we have time for that? We can talk shop. Okay, mm-hmm. so I find this really interesting. So, um, you just define the playstyle as playing around like monster objectives. Obviously, that's not yeah the only thing that you guys do. But I do think that that's actually quite fair for looking at Shalka. You guys love to play around like level six windows or play with like big playmaking ultimates. Yeah. Um, Sejuani, Skarner, big champions for you guys. Uh, Sejuani for everyone, but like I think Skarner more so for Shalka. But my thing is, is that while that playstyle I think is very consistent and against not bad teams but most teams in league of legends because it's kind of like the fundamental way to play is we set up for dragon we set up for baron this is what we do with our vision it's now a team fight and go whereas i feel like the game is actually moving to a different pace where it's much more about base timers controlling tempo taking small advantages and then but since you're taking them all the time you're pushing rather than setting up for like everything's even big team fight you know what i mean yeah yeah yeah, moving the chains i I understand but I, I also see us playing very active as well. No, like um, a team like G2, for example, just like us, is willing to play Sejuani in melee comps and fight a lot. So I don't think it's necessarily a poor way to play. I, I think it's just good. I just think that if you are only playing for monster objectives, you ultimately, not that you, you only play for yeah, them, but if that's I, like I, a don't, big I, just, I don't think we're only playing for monster objectives. It just puts your team on a bit of a timer. And if you're only or if you're one of your bread and butters is playing around like um, Sejuani ultimate or Skarner ultimate, yeah. it's then only when my Skarner has flash in this ultimate, can I actually execute and make a play? Whereas if you look at G2, they play compositions where they're almost always on the offensive or they play with champions that have much lower cooldowns where they're constantly putting out pressure. Like the thing about their Pike is Pike's mobility and his ability to attack the map. He's like always on the offensive. He's never on a Sejuani where he has a big cooldown where he needs to wait but for something. Has G2 not like first pick Sejuani every time it's been up in, uh, uh, in the past month, for example? Sejuani is uh, absolutely just a broken bus <laughs> yeah, champion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I guess it's nerfed a bit on this patch, so. True. But it's just kind of the the pace, I guess, of shelf yeah. games where it's like uh, waiting for advantages where you guys kind of funnel farm into lane. You don't take a lot of kills into the lane uh, comparatively to other teams. And then you are much more a team-focused game where either Ignar makes a roam or gets a, a better ba- a base timer, a big ultimate comes up, a huge team fight. And then, like, it's kind of like, do you do you watch American football? Um, A bit. I think about Schalke as like um, the pass game team where it's about big movements of okay. chains where you guys like dump the ball deep, you grab it and then it's like, okay, we just got 20 yards. But for a while it, it kind of sits there. Whereas like G2 are like a running game team where they're constantly running the ball and making these small increments. But because they're so fast, they then just start to run over teams. Like the endurance doesn't yeah, keep up. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. And often um, we haven't had too many games that have ended, I would say, in like the first five or six minutes. So, I, I, whereas G2, I think there's games where Caps will kill mid, go back to mid, kill mid again, TP top, dive top, all in like the first, you remember that game? <laughs> yeah. All in the first six minutes. So, I think that's fair. And we've also had a, a couple games that have kind of gone bad in first five, six minutes. Um, I think in playoffs, that's not as important because I see these these specific games where it's over in six minutes as kind of outliers. Mm-hmm. That will happen every once in a while. So... While I would like to win some games in five minutes in playoffs, I'm not too concerned about that myself. It's more like the long yeah, exactly. consistency. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. So talking about that, I mean, best of five is going to be a big shift for a lot of teams. Um, how much changes do you think for your team? You talked a lot about like execution on the in game is very like free flowing, but the preparation going up to yep. it does that just like is this a huge increase on burden, or is your life just so much easier because now you get to watch like a single team's footage and prepare for a single team? Um, I've prepped for so many best of fives <laughs> in my career, like over the past like five year, five or so years, that to me it's normal, and I kind of have learned from a lot of my past best of fives of what works and what doesn't, how much you want to be flexible, but also how much you want to be able to stick to comfort. So I think the best is just have a good mix of stuff that you know will be good um, in, in every single role. 
but then also have some stuff that's specifically designed to counter the enemy. So uh, I personally really like uh, approaching for best of fives because I feel like if you do it correctly and you are better, you're more likely to win. So that's why I like it more than best of ones. So um, yeah, I think the approach is very structured and like we have a very set plan like already, you know, going into the week that we're preparing. In preparing for Vitality, how difficult is that or how easy is that? Um, I don't think it's very difficult. I prepared for them in playoffs before and I know um, like Schalke played them last year in playoffs as well and, and they did it quite well. Um, I think Vitality have a set of plans that they're good at, a set of plays that they're that they're quite good at, but they're kind of predictable at least in the early game or in the mid game um late game they become a, a lot more kind of free-flowing and yolo and make some crazy decisions sometimes but i think for as far as prepping like the early and mid game it's nothing that we haven't seen before and is it then that if you guys get to that late game phase that you just have confidence shock are the better players yeah we, we played them twice this split with an early game lead and Closing the game was not like necessarily too difficult because I, I think we're solid. We have a lot of veterans. We know what to do. And I trust my team like in a best of five scenario to close if we're ahead. Yeah, and I mean, just like looking, we have the, the scoreboards in front of us of your previous games. Uh, you know, and obviously a scoreboard does not tell you yeah. really much of anything about actually how a game played out. But it does show some pretty fat KDAs and <laughs> what appear to be a hilariously one-sided game. There were some stomps, I think. Yeah, you have a 37-minute win, which was a bit longer, but definitely stompy, it looks like, and a 28-minute win. So, I mean, history definitely seems to, to favor Schalke. Is there anything outside of that, like, late game craziness that like makes you nervous going against vitality they're not necessarily known for like crazy innovative picks obviously jizuke has one or two niche picks kabashard has one or two niche picks but is there anything that you're like really on the lookout for when it comes to so the, them? the first time uh i prepared for vitality at best of five i believe was with fanatic um and they did this thing where Buipo was coming in i believe it was he was the rookie uh coming in for his first playoff series and they had a strategy that was just based on not even farming mid waves and just going top as three and perma diving our top laner. And they actually did this for like four games straight. Uh, I haven't seen them do that this split that much because I don't think it's a particularly good strategy. But maybe this is something they could try and do that would be a bit uh, explosive. So really, like the really, I'm not. I would call that cheese. I would say so. Like the really, like the really big cheese. Like he wasn't so like even farming the wave at some at some point. Sacrificing conventional turn. strategy yeah. just to particularly go for for one avenue of attack. Yeah, and it's 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 interesting when I look at this matchup because I think that like stability for me definitely favors on the side of Schalke. Like you guys are no doubt in my mind the safe bet, but having Jack Troll on like Vitality is pretty confident. Um, and I'm curious from your perspective, Frost, like. We now we've we've heard a bit from Dylan about how the team prepares. We've heard a bit from Jack earlier in the day. Like, what was your initial assumption for this series coming into the day, and is like has it changed at all? So I feel like when I watch Schalke, um, I said this on PGL that like Schalke for me are like the definition of the good team in the LEC. That if you are not capable of doing what Schalke does, then you're not a good team. Yeah. I think your guys' fundamentals are really clean. I think you guys have consistency, and then you have really talented players. Um, but I want Schalke to be a great team, and I feel like. Personally, that it probably will take more time to find synergy with your players um, just because you didn't have trick all year. Yeah. And it just takes that time to build it back up. But I'm curious what the ceiling will be. So for this stylistic matchup, let's say Vitality are playing their absolute best, that you get the best version of Vitality. I think it's a curious matchup because you guys will put ABBA on things like Akali a lot, but he won't necessarily play a lot of side lanes. He'll play more in skirmishes and team fights, whereas uh, Vitality love to play side lanes. They almost never actually group up until yeah. very recently. And so stylistically, I'm like, that could be interesting. You know, when do Shalka pick their moments to go for those skirmishes, those team fights, get those big chain movements versus if they miss their window, then Vitality and will have Jizuke and Cabochard like grabbing all of this farm theoretically into a side lane and then having those crazy backdoor scenarios where Cabochard Kabashar Jizuke do like a crazy thing. So stylistically, I think it's interesting because I think you guys are very polarizing opposite teams um, in terms of consistency, always bet on Schalke. And in terms of like kind of pound for pound, player for player, especially in team fights, always bet on Schalke, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel like this, these backdoor side lane um, end the game sort of plays though only work when you're ahead in the game or quite ahead, or at least your soul laners are very, very ahead in the game. And at least seeing how mid lane has gone playing them this year, I'm not so sure this is going to happen in like three out of five games, for example. Yeah, and it'd be interesting too, because I think in last playoffs, if um, if you guys had faced, I would have been uh, more 
more skeptical with like the struggles that Abadage has, but it feels like he has grown um, significantly as a player, both like in game in terms of his synergy with Trick, and additionally in cleaning up, let's say, some of those int moments that yeah. we saw. Um, what is what is your opinion, kind of on on that mid lane matchup, Jazuke versus Abadage specifically? Or is this something where you prep a player like Abadage specifically for something like an Echo matchup because he knows he's playing against Jazuke, puts more time into that? Or is this something where, like, at this point with the growth that he's had, you're just not concerned whatsoever? So uh, always when you're prepping against Jazuke, you need to be a little bit mindful because he plays a lot of um, different champions that are not always seen. Like, he'll bust out the Echo, he'll bust out the Talia from time to time. So you kind of need to be a bit um, mindful of what you blind pick, for example, or what... Like, not leaving yourself open to get kind of exploited where he can just roam around the map. Uh, that being said, I think just the more important thing, though, is just making sure you're playing together with your jungler well out of mid. Because I think that's something Vitalia has struggled with for, like, two years now. Um, so I don't really expect that to change going, like, in one week. Um, so that's a lot more of the focus rather than champions, I think, is just how we're playing with our jungler around mid. I think there's two ways that this can go. Uh, we actually just talked to Jack Troll previously. Yeah. Um, Jizuke is a guy, and I think Vitality are a team, that they love playing either side of the Corky matchup. Like, Jizuke will have no problem leaving Corky's open for blue side picks and then taking, like, a Silas or whatever into mm -hmm. it and trading. Or he'll take the Corky himself into the Assassin matchup and be fine. Um, but like you said, Mowgli is almost never playing around Jizuke. He has, like, one of the lowest jungle proximities of any of our mid laners. And Jizuke will be, like, jumping forward on Tristana, and yeah. Mowgli will be, like, on Krug Camp. So you can either play this where... <laughs> yeah, it happens. Um, you can either play this where... You give away the uh, assassin quirky matchup, and then you just take like the stronger two v two if Abba has an assassin, and then you have trick on something like Sejuani that controls River really well, and then just like hard skirmish repeatedly, and either zone Jazuke out where he's just literally sitting in his thing, and then cheat out to side lanes, or you can just probably sit back, play the Azir, and uh, Mowgli and Jazuke will not work together to control River. But this is the best part about this patch: is that both Azir and Quirky are nerfed. And I think oh, the thank the, God, we're right. Corky, we're on that new patch. Corky nerfs are huge. Azir nerfs oh, are less, I yes. think, impactful. Yep. yep. I'm so f***ing tired of those champions. Actually, I don't think we played Corky on stage to split either. So. No, you play Azir almost exclusively when you play one or the other. And then usually it's the Assassins. Yeah. You're like the Azir Akali Skarner team. You don't have to... No, I, I, think, I think there was a meme that Abba only plays champions that start with an A. I think he had, <laughs> he had like Azir Akali Aatrox only for like <laughs> two months or something. So... <laughs> We were thinking of picking up a Nivea and Annie for playoffs as secret picks. I'm just, just, okay. <laughs> you know, well, honestly, why not? That's a yeah, very LEC yeah. decision. <laughs> <laughs> okay, throw out all the analysis. I'm so happy. Quirky and Azir, please no more. And this is this is my question. I don't want you to give away any special picks. I know from watching pro player solo queue that people are pretty hot on Cinder right now. It's not clear to me whether or not that she always feels stronger She's in solo so queue. Blind pickable. If you always feel strong in solo queue, I'm always curious to how that what, what, what happens when enemy Jarvan comes to your lane? Well, you die, but okay, <laughs> unless okay, you yeah. hold your E, oh, you wait for him yeah, to yeah, land, yeah. and then hopefully you have flash. E, run. Yeah. Very gankable champion. Uh, good old Syndra. But I'm curious, is this a patch that like your team is feeling happy with without giving away too much? Do you guys feel like you have a good grasp on it? Because patch prep is the other big aspect of this playoffs, right? In the sense that there's a brand new patch just for playoffs. Um, when it's like playoffs patch, I do a lot of work myself to make sure that we completely understand the changes and the ramifications of it. And uh, going into the week, we had a good idea of how we want to approach it. So at least so far, yeah, I, I think it's quite a good patch for us, actually. Have you guys already started scrimming for playoffs? Yeah, of course. And do you feel like the practice is healthy and you already have like your patch plans or do you figure out patch, like get an idea, see if it works in scrims and then refine from there? No, I, I'm generally coming up with like a full plan for the week beforehand okay. um, of exactly what we want to do. And obviously if it's not working, you need to change something. But things have been going so well for us in the past, I'd say two to three weeks that mostly the plans are good because they're working. Yeah. There you go. And that's interesting because like the other thing that happens um, like more often than not for Worlds is like, with when you scrim specific things, and this happens a lot in EU too, I know that like players will be like, oh yeah, this champion is OP. Yeah. We've only played against players who are good, either A, good at that champion to the point where it's like an unwinnable matchup. Um, has that ever been an issue for, for you as a coach, um, like prepping for playoffs or seeing these instances where players are like, I am convinced this character is broken, and then you find out like, two days later on stage, like, oh, wait, no, it's, like, actually terrible. Well, I'm the the original Lucian Top uh, ah, yes. coach. So I, coach, I forgot, so, yeah. So <laughs> I would be lying if I say that's never happened to me. 
<laughs> in my career, but it really depends. Um, for example, if you have stable picks you've played throughout the split that have worked, um, like let's say, for example, they did not change Cork in his year and we had played it the whole split. And then that goes into playoffs. Like you just know that you can pick these champions on stage and they will work and it will not be bad. So I think it's very important for playoffs, at least from my mindset, to have this roster of picks that you know cannot be bad. So then when you go into like a stressful game four scenario, game five scenario, like you're not questioning like, is this secret pick going to work or not? Because that, I don't think it's good when you think you're the better team. At least that's how I approached it last year. That's kind of how I approach it this year. And then you have kind of more special stuff you can try and then not have to rely on when it comes down to it. Do you guys have any like, Special picks. Yeah, of course. We always have special How many, picks. Can I get like a ballpark number? No, like no, I, I, like I can't. 300, like 300 different unique <laughs> like eight picks. special picks. Eight, Every eight, roll. Eight special yeah, picks. Yeah, no, no. It's going to show up on broadcast. We'll be like, this is the fourth one. He gave us a list. This is number four. It's Wonder Seven World. Oh, what my. Is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Seven Wonders. Seven Wonders. Seven Wonders of the World. The, yeah. seven, nice. the seven Wonders. That's actually funny. <laughs> seven edgy top line picks, <laughs> including, but not limited to. Soraka. We got, we got the Kazakh Sop last Javana. week. Yeah, it was, oh, yeah. It was hit and miss. They're not all Wonders. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm honestly really curious to see what Schalke does. It's like a final question before we wrap up here, Dylan. Um, we, we focused a lot on your matchup specifically versus Vitality. Uh, but I'm curious, Worlds is the goal for the team. Yeah. Is this where you have, are you like preparing for a gauntlet? You said kind of like trying to be a more humble team or are you like eyes on taking down Fnatic or G2 and like trying to secure that first seed? Um, I actually think for our team it's possible. I think for some other teams... Uh, in playoffs right now, it's not possible. Obviously, it's extremely hard uh, to win the entire split, considering we would have to win, I believe it's four best of fives in a row and probably beat Fnatic and G2 in best of five. Um, but at least from from scrimming, we do not feel like this is an impossible thing. Uh, we feel like we're one of the, the top three teams right now. And if we have a good run, maybe. But uh, yeah, for us, mainly the goal is Worlds. What's like the probability number? Oh, I don't. I don't know. It would be. Hard you can lowball. It's fine. <laughs> um, I don't know. Probably like uh, under twenty percent or something to like win first in the split for sure. It's just I think a that's lot of, more a lot than of most chances. teams would yeah. say. Yeah. And it's interesting because you're right. Like the 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 difficulty of the task of winning the split if you're not fanatic or G two right now because of the way our, our playoff system works is just so disgustingly monumental. Yeah. Because you will play Fnatic and G two if you want to win this. Like like don't get me wrong, if we're playing against Fnatic in a best of five tomorrow, I, I wouldn't hate our chances by any means, but it's just winning so many in a row, you know. That's yeah. that's difficult, I think. I mean huge burden. Uh, I am excited to see what you guys do versus uh Vitality. Is that Saturday? Saturday. Yeah it's Saturday. Thank God that you know. I should know that, but I'm not good at my job, apparently. All right. Thank you again for joining us, Dylan. Um, I'm curious to see what Schalke can do on the stage, how they can bust out, and of course, uh, get ready for Attila versus Upset, the rivalry that will never die, despite the fact that both players are not really fueling the fire anymore. Do you have any closing words? Um, and nothing in particular. Just hope that we show up and just play normally, you know, play to our strengths and... Um, play to what I know we can do so at least we can make it to the next round and see, see if we can make it to Worlds. See, you joke, but when we talk about like the texture of the team now, Schalke are like, we don't have to do clutch moments, we're not trying to like put confidence in the player, Schalke just show, show up and like, if we just play normal, we're fine. fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't do anything weird. <laughs> Except for, of course, the eight weird picks which will be handed to us in a spreadsheet and we will um, let you guys know the second that they show up in the draft. Alright, thank you Dylan, that's going to do it for Schalke. Okay. Alright, welcome to our fourth and final guest. It is none other than Finn. I, I, is it safe to call you a rookie top one? You've played, you played a couple games on stage. Uh, I would say so. I, I see myself as a rookie this split. I mean, last split, I really came into the team and I wasn't really a part of the team from the beginning. Like I feel like with this team, it's actually my team and I'm mm. playing with them. So I feel like this is my rookie split. How nuts is it to look across at the other top lanes? You got what? Cabochard, Chachi, Odo, oh and Bwipo. Wonder. got Wonder. And wonder. Oh God! <laughs> nice, by the way. <laughs> How, is that is that crazy to like be in this your first full split because you were here with the team the whole time, right? Yeah. Even if Prof was playing a lot of the games, but um, is that how does that feel as like a new player to be in playoffs against? I mean, a lot of I think literally every single one of those names is iconic in terms yeah. of European top players. I mean, it's like I know the saying is like practice until your rivals become wait practice until your idols become your rivals, right? And I was like. I always looked up to these top laners, and now I'm playing against all these like guys that I saw as gods before. But now 
I'm a part of them, kinda. Not really, not yet, but I'm playing with them and against them. So, I mean, it's been a very learning for experience for sure. Have you ever seen Hercules? The the, the Disney movie. The Disney movie. Yeah, yeah, I've <laughs> yeah. Seen it. You're basically like Hercules right now. Yeah. <laughs> like you're mortal. You're trying to get into like Olympus. You can go through godhood. I've got the narrative all figured you, out. You really, really do. Who you wants want... to be Meg on Rogue? No, stop. <laughs> I don't think anyone wants to be that. <laughs> <laughs> where okay so here's my question Finn. Yeah. Where did where did you come from? What is your background? I, I come from Sweden. Why? Well, okay, I knew that one. I know you're from Sweden, but like talk to me about like your history here in League of Legends. Was it like kind solo of, queue? Yeah. I mean, I started playing solo queue a lot around season 6, I think. And uh, I just kind of climbed really fast as an Aurelia one trick. The old Aurelia, the, the cool Aurelia. The cool, that is what you call the cool Aurelia. I mean, okay, maybe not. Equilibrium strike, your yes. point and click stun. Yes. Okay. Max that shit. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I kind of started like climbing and I was not very good, but eventually I got some offers and I was like, okay, guess I'll try out. Uh, just playing some competitive, some random like tournaments around Europe. Uh, as I found out that if you play tournaments as a one trick, people will ban your champions. And that's quite the issue if you want to win, but it it was a progress. And eventually, I started picking up new champions. Um, and from there on, I kind of kind of jumped around from team to team in the lower leagues until I finished my high school in uh, mid season eight, I guess. And I went to play my first like full team in Spain in Movistar Star Riders. And from there on, I just kind of kept like going to new teams and uh, eventually ended up in Rogue Academy. So. You finished high school yeah. and then you immediately went to pro. Yeah, the was there a a big decision to to you know either forego either going directly into work or higher education, whatever it was, versus going and following the professional career? Or did you always know mm -hmm. I'm going to be a pro gamer? I mean, I had a lot of offers before I finished high school, so I kind of like led that off. I played some online splits. Like I played one split of the Nordic League online during school, and uh, I just kind of knew that. I just want to finish my high school education first, so I can always rely on that if I go back. But I kind of knew. I mean, the day after I graduated, I immediately took the flight down to Spain and started practicing with my team. So it was kind of what I wanted to do. Did you think that there was a big difference between... Because you talked about you are one trick, you go to these tournaments, your champions <laughs> get banned. So like, what's the biggest difference between when you first started playing in solo queue versus actually being an LEC caliber top laner? I mean, there's too much to go into. I mean, there's so many things to it. But I mean, the key parts, I think, is just playing with a team, in a team, and like realizing what that kind of means for you. Uh, like the decisions you have to make in a competitive environment is very different to the ones you have to make in a solo queue. Like... The decisions you can make to become the best solo queue player are usually not the decisions you make to become the best competitive player. So it's just about finding consistency in your play and uh, trying to figure out what works for you and how you want to approach the game. What At what point in your career do you feel like you were learning the most? Because obviously you had this time in Spain and Movie Star Riders and presumably slightly before that where you were going from Aurelia to hopefully more champions, <laughs> right? Like, is this is this period on Rogue been the biggest period of growth for you? Or do you feel like because you haven't had as much stage time that it was mm. maybe more during the time uh, in Spain? I mean, I think when I first joined Rogue Academy this winter, I immediately got into this team with a lot of talent. As you can see now, we're all playing in LEC. But for an uh, academy level team, that team was like, incredibly stacked. And all these players are very smart and have a lot of knowledge. So I learned a lot from my teammates playing in Rogue Academy to kind of catch up to their level. Um, so I think that I would say that's when I learned the most. Who's um, the who's taught you the most? I mean, I think it's Vander probably. He has so much like experience and knowledge and we are like his little rookie squad that he's kind of leading around um, ever since like the first split in the Polish league. Uh, so he kind of teaches us all these concepts that he's picked up over all these years of playing because he's played for so long now mm. and he has like gathered so many so much knowledge and experience that he's kind of he's kind of tries to lead that knowledge onto us so vander's phil Van oh my god <laughs> stop trying to force the hercules metaphor all right you can't just see someone's jaw and then just assign them hercules that's not it's not how it works for us <laughs> um so i'm curious then like 
it's very easy for me to see how Vander can be this kind of authority figure out a game. Does that transition in game? Like, is he the primary voice of communication or is this kind of a shared responsibility on your team? I, f- I would say it's a very shared responsibility. I think we all kind of fill our roles in a team in how the dynamic works in the communication. Like one guy doesn't necessarily talk much and it's not even the same every game. Like different games, different people talk much depending on their champion and their, like how many, how much resources they're getting, how, mu- how we want to play around, how we want to play around the persons. So, I mean, it's more like in reviews and uh, outside of the game that he, he gives us this knowledge, while in game we all kind of share the responsibility. Is it, is it surreal? Like, did you expect yourself to be in LEC playoffs in Summer Split? Or did you just kind of like, oh shit, this is really happening, we made it? I mean, I f- the way I tried to approach the situation, because I, I saw in Summer how uh, the expectations of people kind of affected our performance. I know that in the beginning we looked really good with Inspired and Lars and then like all these expe- expectations came like these guys are so good like this, they're the super rookies and then our level kind of dropped I think people saw that you guys were beating TSM apparently <laughs> all over Reddit yeah. uh, so I mean the way I try to approach this I kind of try to go into every game like with a f- blank mindset and just try to take every game as it is and not really have any real expectation of the outcome is it difficult then because you talked about all these top laners being your idols when you rock up into that top lane and yeah. you're looking across at like Wonder or Bwipo on the nameplate. Is that is that hard or do you just focus on, okay, I got to do this with my wave. I got to communicate this to my jungler. Mm, I mean, it's kind of like, like I said, I try to approach every game like in a blank state. I don't really care who's on the other side. I just try to focus on myself and what I need to do because if I get like too caught up in the nameplates, I, I mean, my play might become a lot worse, I think. Will you ever try to like style on someone if given the chance? I mean, of course. <laughs> I mean that's th- th- I mean that's the most fun part about the game. I think to to get the solo kills to to make the outplay happen. Like, uh, I mean, it's always like if you can see it, you go for it. It's interesting that you bring that up because I was thinking about this uh, last night while we were prepping for for this discussion, uh, and I was trying to figure out how I would define your car- your top lane's play style. And it's very much carry top laners. I would define you as like, but that's also what's good in the meta, right? Yeah. Like most people are playing kind of carry style top laners. So I'm curious when you look at yourself, like, are you ready for the burden of going to tank duty when tanks inevitably come back? Or are you kind of kind of guy that wants to play carries forever? I mean- if I have the choice, of course I'll play Karis, but I'll always play the best champions, I think. So, I mean, in Spain I played, I was on Shogaf Orn duty every game, kind of. <laughs> I mean, it did the job, but it's not as fun. But I think in this meta, I'm really comfortable with the, the champions at the top, of top bin. I feel like I can win a lot of the matchups both sides, and I feel like, I'm, I always feel very comfortable playing these champions right now. So, I'm happy with how the meta is right now. What would you say is Rogue as a team, like your guys' greatest strength and your greatest weakness? Because mm. I think there's there's something interesting where each one of the Rogue players, every time we talk to you guys, like mm. you guys have this confidence and yeah. you guys are quite aware that you're underdogs and there's not like a ton of pressure on you because yeah. everyone didn't expect you guys to get here. But, you know, what ultimately do you think was the reason why Ro got here? What made you guys good at, as a team? Is it your teamwork or your synergy? I mean, you guys have I mean, been I've, together for so yeah. long. I think we're all very talented players. Like all five of us have a very high skill ceiling. And it's all about kind of, I mean, that's kind of our biggest weakness as well. Like it's about finding consistency in our play and kind of always performing to the top of our abilities, right? Because we'll have games where we play super well in scrims and then when it comes to stage, we will play a lot differently. We might not make the plays we would make in scrims. More conservatively? Yeah, a bit. Like, it's about finding... I think it comes with experience as well, because we have, like, three rookies. But we just have to kind of get comfortable with our play, get comfortable with how we want to play, and always being able to execute it no matter the, the situation. And I think that, like, for me, um, that's a very common thing that we hear. Uh, and actually used to hear a ton more, right? And, and back when it was the EU LCS, it was like so many teams just struggled horrifically to like transition play. Um, and it's something that we haven't heard from nearly as much, I think, in recent years, but it makes sense when you have a lot of rookies. Um, is this something that like the rogue staff is like actively trying to help you on? Do you feel like this is a confidence thing? Do you feel like this is an issue that you've kind of like figured out why this is happening? Or is it kind of just like, this is the big project is figuring out, okay, why does it work so well in scrims, but why isn't, the same thing happening. I mean, we try to work with our performance coach a lot. We 
he helps us kind of get these routines and we kind of follow these routines on game days as well to like kind of get into the same mood as we do on uh, normal scrim days. So, I mean, it's something that we're working on for sure and we're hopefully going to fix it for this weekend. How confident are you guys going into your first best of five? You're across from Splice, so yeah. it's probably a tall order. I don't think a lot of people are expecting Rogue to win that. Um, do you guys feel, I love that, do you guys feel uh, confident about it? I mean, you could have gotten Shaka or Vitality. Would you have rather one of those teams versus Splice? I mean, we thought we would get Shalk at first. I mean, we feel very confident against Shalk. Actually, I think we have a really good statistical matchup against them. We we usually always perform well against them. Uh, but we got Splice, which is... I, mean, I think they're pretty similar, Splice and Shalk, yeah, in their level. So I'm not really that scared of them at all. I think if we play well on the day, we'll for sure beat them. 3-1 or 3-0 or 3-2. It doesn't really matter, but... A win's a win. A win is a win, of course. It's all about... an. Um, how we play on the game, I think our biggest enemies this day is going to be ourselves. And we kind of need to figure out how we want to play and how we want to approach the, the best of five scenario. And kind of figure out what champions we want to play. But um, if we can do that properly, I think we for sure have a big chance to win. So then my question is, you're talking about the biggest opponent being yourself. And I, and I respect that, like trying to bring your best performance to stage. But for me, the biggest opponent I see for you is Vizichachi. And I'm curious how you feel. You've played against, you got only got to play in one of the matchups. Profit, of course, played the first time you guys played versus Splice. You played one of the matchups. You got to play your legendary Kled. <laughs> the first fun fact we had about when you got in, into the scene. This guy plays Kled. That's what we could say about <laughs> Finn coming in. Um, and, you know, I think that it went okay for you in the matchup. But overall, like, obviously, the, the it was a rough game. Zerse was was popping off. Um, so I'm curious, are, are you... Are you confident heading that? You say you like to play the nameplates off, but obviously you can do some research ahead of time. You yeah. can look at those opponents' tendencies. What do you think of Vizichachi? I mean, I told you I was an Aurelia one trick, right? Yeah. Like the old Aurelia. And yeah. the legendary old Aurelia was Vizichachi, right? So it was kind of the player I looked up to the most, like season six, whatever, when I started playing. So it's really fun playing against him, finally. Our first game, uh, I didn't really play that well, I think. I think I played pretty poorly in laning phase, and we just kind of got rolled over. But I think we, we didn't bring our A game that day. I think we were a bit off, all of us. But um, I feel like Vizasachi, I gave him some credit in, when I was on the post-game lobby. Uh, I think he's a really solid top laner right now. He kind of always does his job, except for maybe that Fnatic game where he kind of had an off game. But I don't think it's anything to worry about for him. Um, and I think he's pretty comfortable in his meta as well. He has some really like safe champions that he can always pick, like the Gangplank. The, the Shannon got buffed this patch. It's also an old favorite of his. So we just kind of have to, I mean, I kind of know what he'll pick in a situation, so I kind of just need to prepare myself for that and uh, figure out the way how to respond to it. Is your Jax ready? Who knows? <laughs> That's what I'm saying, because I'm like, we're talking about what he's going to play and you need to be prepared for it, but I guarantee that in at least 60% of scenarios, it'll be a blind pick GP, and you yeah. just need to figure out how to beat blind pick GP. <laughs> the clay didn't work out last time, but we'll hopefully prepare something new hopefully. for it. I would love the Shen Jax matchup, and just Shen pieces out, and oh Jax is like, God. leave, it's fine. Bring back Shivana and Renekton. Exactly. Let's, just, let's just go back to the... That was an awful top lane meta. But the thing is, is Jax is like, come back, I dare you. And uh, Shen's like, I can't lane against him. My, my, my coach Freddy wanted to do is to bust up the Mundo if ready. So. Oh my god. Oh, Mundo, so Mundo broken. got super buffed this patch. I'm hype. Um, oh wow. I mean, we've talked a lot about Vander and I, I kind of like understand what Vander brings to the table. But I'm, I'm actually also, the other player I really want to talk about is Inspired. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously like the super BuzzFeed headline about Inspired that's like easy to bring up any time is he's good at Olaf. <laughs> he's exceptionally good at Olaf, uh, which I think is, is a good testament to him. But from there, it gets like a little murkier. You know, there's a little more room for opinion. Uh, like the whole like, how big is his champion pool? A lot of people, a lot of analysts are like very quick to call him a very cerebral. Is he, does he talk a lot? Does he like tell you what is happening on the map? Yeah, I think inspired for the person that's young, he has a really good game sense. He kind of knows what's going on in the game, and he kind of understands how tempo works and how plays work. Like, if they make a play, we have to make a play on the cross map, or yada, 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 yada. Um, so I feel like he's very active, especially in the early game. His communication is really solid, and he, he brings a lot of structure to how we want to approach the early game. And he also is not afraid to, to say no to his teammates. If, if someone is begging for a gank, you know, he says, no, this is bad, please just play, play for yourself. <laughs>
I mean, that's good to hear. I, I, when you look at this in preparing, do you know um, anything about how he prepares for jungle matchups in the same way I'm asking you about Vizitachi? Because both times, uh, the last time, two times you guys have played, Zersei, I think, got the better of Inspired. Inspired was on Skarner both yeah. games. One of the games was like pretty okay, like you talked about, the maybe not the best showing um, from Rogue overall. But this most recent game, it was like this catastrophic jungle performance from Zersei that felt like it, it kind of dismantled your team. Um, is this something that he's very aware of? Does he like, is he the kind of player that looks a lot at opponent jungle pathing and like tries to read those habits or does he kind of rely on going into game and just seeing what happens? Yeah, I mean, if, what's really impressive about Inspired is very often using ProView to kind of research opposing junglers to to see how they think and how they look and how they path. So I think uh, he's for sure going to have something prepared for Xerxes. Ooh, and I love that. I love that addition of ProView, actually. I, I ProView is fantastic. I'm a massive fan of it myself. How much have you have you used it a lot to look at how to play specific champions? Yeah, I, I mean, if I see a matchup being played in LC or LCS, I can always look at how two decently good top laners would play that matchup out. So it's very nice having this huge library of just knowledge that you can always use to do some research on top lane matchups. Thank you. Can you actually look directly at that camera and then just, just tell Vettius that ProView is amazing? <laughs> that one. ProView is amazing. ProView is amazing. That's Thank for you, Vettius. <laughs> I don't know. I missed the context entirely as to why that needs to Vettius be said. Vettius and I fight over this all the time where he's just like, what can I gain from ProView that I wouldn't be able to gain from watching the VOD? And I'm like, you can see what they're thinking, what they're looking at. He's like, but I can't hear comms. I'm like, but you can just assume things. You can read lips. You learn a lot. Sorry. Use F keys. <gasps> <laughs> All right, there, there we go. That's a PSA for Vettius, I guess, and any other ProView doubters at this point. Um, when you look at now your matchup versus Splice, like you talked about, hey, we show up and they were feeling confident. What do you think is like your strongest point in this Splice matchup? Like, what is if there's anything that like you think you can leverage to take down Splice? Is it a guy like Inspired in the Jungle? Is it your raw top lane talent to beat former Aurelia God Vizachachi? Like, is there anything that you guys think that you have? in general, that's like a big edge over Splice? Mm, I think we are really good at getting like strong leads and kind of, how to say it, we, we are really good at reading what they want to do in the early game and kind of countering that and getting a lead ourselves to not really get them the chance to, to get their lead, kind of stall out the game and then win like they want to do. I think Splice's biggest weakness is, I think they're pretty bad at finishing out games with a massive lead. I remember the, our game against us, they had like 8k lead at 20 minutes or something. And it was still like a 35 minute game and we kind of just held on. So I feel like if we don't even give them that lead, I don't think they... I mean, if we can get an early game lead, I feel like we'll have a, a much easier time finishing out the game than they will have against us. Mm -hmm. And when you look at this matchup, did we already ask 3 0 three, three, one? Oh, he said a win's a win. He said a win's a win. It doesn't matter if it's a 3 0, 3 1, or 3 2. Well, it doesn't matter to, to you, but it matters to the people at home and to me because I'm curious how, like, is this. Do you feel like. Because Rogue and Best of Five is kind of untested. Yeah. Do you feel like you guys are prepped for best of fives? You've all you've obviously had a lot of experience I in mean, the lower league. I was gonna say, don't don't you guys have a ton of experience as this roster in best of five format because of like you masters and stuff? I mean not European Masters because we kinda shit the bed there, but <laughs> I mean we played a lot of best of fives before. We played quite a bit in Polish League, but it's a, I mean, it's vastly different from the LSE stage playing against like the top teams in Europe, the best of five. So but you guys have done this song and dance before. Yeah, we have. Like, we're not really that um, scattered situation, and we kind of know what we want to do, how we want to approach it. So, I, I don't think it's going to be a problem. Why should anyone be a rogue fan? Ooh, that's a good way to end. Because we're the future of Europe. <laughs> I do like that. Future of Europe. There you go. And Finn is is Hercules, <laughs> apparently. Corner. And Vander is Phil. And Vander is Phil. Which makes Wool Eye Pegasus. All right, I'm on board now. This is really funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Finn, that's all the time we have. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, excited to see you once again. Rogue versus Splice. Who will take the match? That's Friday, right? Yeah. God, I will get it right one day, folks. Finn I'm casting one of these. Finn faces Splice on Friday. Yes, I do. got it. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, folks. That's it. All right, four guests. Round one of playoffs is coming up. On Friday, it will be Rogue versus Splice. It took me an entire episode to learn that. On Saturday, <laughs> it will be Schalke versus Vitality. Now, in our final moments here for Oscar, we've talked to four people. We've heard from every team's representative. We've talked about matchups. 
Has anything changed in your mind? What are your What are your predictions here? No, Splice is going to beat Rogue. Shalka will beat Vitality. Splice will beat Shalka. Splice will lose to Fnatic because Fnatic will lose to G two, and then Fnatic will beat oh Splice, God. and then G two will beat we Fnatic. Have a part two. Don't spoil everything now. Well, that's like the standard. I don't know. Maybe on the day because this is this always happens. I go back. I watch a bunch of vods. It's biasy of like which vods I watch leading up to the cast. <laughs> You're like, I watched a lot of bad vods from this team. There, it's going to be pretty yikes. Um, and then everything changes. So All don't right. hold me to it until I'm on broadcast. There you go. All right. So let her give her time to adjust her opinions, folks. Um, this is the end of the episode, but I just want to give it. I actually have something that I want to say. Okay. Okay. I wanted to talk about Ender. I wanted to compliment Ender specifically. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to take a moment on the end of Euphoria. Um, I know that there's been like conversation in the community about um, casters in general. And I wanted to keep it like pretty brief. Like obviously every caster is working to get better. We don't always find it right in the moment. Um, like people have good days, people have bad days. I know I've had plenty of really bad days and some decent ones. Uh, I do just want to say that like, I think everyone in the LAC broadcast team can really get at the jobs. And I think Ender in particular, uh, this is my first kind of like split and a half working with Ender. Um, I'd only really heard him before I joined Europe and then he was kind of late to the party. And I just think that Ender has such an incredible skill ceiling uh, in terms of when he first came in as a caster because of his background in working in like game design or not game design, but like play balance test, team, yeah. play test, that type of stuff. Um, his in-depth knowledge about like jungle pathing, uh, micro interactions, the fact that he's a very skilled player. I strongly believe that like Azale and Ender, if we gave them six months where all they had to do is play the game, that these are the two casters of anyone on the team that could actually go pro. Like they're ridiculous at playing the game. Um, and I just think that having a guy that's so young and a caster who's so new have that much raw talent, I've always been very impressed with Ender. I think Vedius is casting better than he's ever cast. I think... Personally, if I had to pick like a world final today, I would have Vettius in that. I think he's crazy and has definitely filled Deficio's shoes. And I think we have the best play-by-plays in the world in League of Legends. So, boom. That's all I got to say. All right. Uh, it's hard for me to be a host in this scenario because normally my job is to like pull you back and ask follow-up questions. But I'm going to leave that for what it was. Thank you, Frostgren, for your kind words about the LEC broadcast team. Also love Ender. Why not? I love Ender. I love Great. Ender. Uh, we all love Ender. Let us know in the comments if you also love Ender because he's all actually so sick and uh, he's going through the inevitable cycle that literally every caster does when they first start. They're new. We hate They're them. They're new. I don't like it. Who is this person on my screen? I don't know him. And he gets flamed. And, you know, obviously he makes mistakes too. It's not all like totally unjustified. I just um, think he's had some really good moments. His Zerse breakdown that he did uh, in terms of content, the fact that he does a lot of the, he scripts the LEC updates. Yep. Super funny. He does the between two Iverns. Yep. So I think like his content output, both analytical and humorous, top in notch. Completely agree. As a final closing note, um, next week, Fnatic versus G2. Obviously going to be exciting heading into round two along with the winners from this week's matches. But more importantly, we're going to be trying to get Fnatic and G2 on the podcast. And depending on how the players are feeling about each other at the same time. Ooh, so spicy. Spicy. Look forward to that one. In the meantime, this has been episode 10, playoff special part one. It's season four. This is talking with my hands for some reason. That's going to do it for Euphoria. And we'll see you guys later.